Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Marriott Pavilion for our final general session of the day. I'm Kathy Joran, the director of the Food Business School, which is the CIA's Center for Executive and Graduate Education. I trust you all had inspiring and educational experiences at your afternoon breakout sessions. Yes? Yes. All right. Good. Well, before we get started on the next session, I have the pleasure of telling you a little bit about our CIA graduate degree programs. And first, I would like to introduce you to our Master of Professional Studies in Food Business. This is a one-of-a-kind online master's degree business program with a food industry focus. If you or a colleague has been looking for an MBA program, but you haven't found the right fit for your food industry career focus, this may be the program for you. The degree is an excellent fit for an entrepreneur looking to open a restaurant or other food service business, for an innovator who wants to launch a new food product, or for those wishing to further their understanding of to better contribute to an organization or move up within their organization. The program is geared to individuals who are looking to address current challenges in the industry and to build businesses around those challenges. The program is designed for working professionals and is asynchronous with online courses taking place over two years. It was launched in the fall of 2018 with a cohort of 21 students who have just completed their second semester in which they studied ethical leadership in food business and design thinking for food. Although primarily online, there are also three short residencies that are a part of the program two at the CIA's Copia campus in Napa Valley, and one here at the CIA in Hyde Park, where students have a variety of their own educational sessions in addition to attending this Menus of Change conference. It's a picture of our cohort at the Copia campus in Napa. And I am now pleased and proud to announce that this cohort is with us at this conference. And they are with our stellar curriculum designer, Andy Shaka. They are here in the audience, and I would really like all of them to please stand up now and be recognized. There they are. Thank you, guys. They're uh, an amazing uh, cohort, an amazing group of people with some uh, really wonderful aspirations that they've shared with us this week. And I'm just so pleased that they have come together as an incredible supportive cohort. So now I'd like to also mention that we have a second Master of Professional Studies that has evolved from the Beverage Graduate Certificate Program that we've offered for the past several years. This is a Master of Professional Studies in Wine Management and is a unique master's degree that not only takes you from vine to bottle, but also emphasizes how wine makes its way to the table, covering the life cycle of a bottle from marketing to distribution and from restaurants to retail. This program is a 30-week on-campus program, which takes place at the CIA at Greystone in St. Helena, California. It's perfect for those people looking to add a beverage specialization to their credentials, for current beverage professionals looking to advance, or for people who want to indulge their passion for wine and beverages in a potential career change. We are currently accepting applications for both of these master's degree programs for fall of 2019. Both will start in late August or early September. So thank you for indulging me and letting me introduce these programs. And now I'd like to move on to commencing with the next session of the conference. This session will be a discussion format and it's titled The Business Case for Addressing Climate Change, Risk, Opportunity, and Profit. The session will present three case studies that underscore the business case for responding urgently to food-related climate change imperatives, including how success and profit or failure and loss can depend on recognizing the risks of inaction. We have three experienced presenters for this session, as well as, as an excellent moderator who I would like to tell you about now. Michael Kaufman is a partner of Astor Group, a New York boutique merger and acquisition advisory and investment firm, where he focuses on assisting companies primarily in the restaurant and retail sectors with strategy and transactions to raise capital or to buy and sell companies or assets. A nationally recognized industry leader, Michael previously led Metro Media Restaurant Group, created and successfully exited a restaurant startup, 
and innovated a restaurant brand for a luxury retailer. Michael is a visiting executive at the Harvard Business School, where he co-developed a course called Challenges and Opportunities in the Restaurant Industry. He served as chairman of the board for the National Restaurant Association and is currently a director of the NRA, a trustee emeritus of the Culinary Institute of America, and the NRA's Educational Foundation. He's an executive advisor to Griffin Investors, a director of Dessert Holdings, LLC, and a trustee of North, Northern Westchester Hospital. He has served on several additional industry boards and is the recipient of a number of industry awards. Michael is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School and is currently the chair of Change Business Leadership Council for the conference. Please welcome Michael Kaufman to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So before introducing our um, extraordinary presenters, I'd just like to take a minute about the Menus of Change and the Business Leadership Council. Along with Vice Chair Siobhan Hansen from Google, we hope to engage with the Business Leadership Council to further its engagement with the wider restaurant and food service industry. The Menus of Change initiative, as you know, is unique in many ways. It's a collaboration between a leading culinary college and a leading school of public health. It not only tracks the latest developments in science, it also tracks the latest developments in the industry. It, it pairs, it marries knowledge with the application of knowledge. This summit provides deep dives into the science behind concerns regarding health, nutrition, and sustainability, but also presents methods and techniques for implementing culinary responses to those scientific insights. Implementation, that's the key. Without engagement across our industry, without buy-in from industry leaders and participants, the guidance from this summit and the annual report will have little or no impact. And so I call on each of you to engage with Siobhan and me at uh, networking at some of the receptions or breakfasts or lunches and the other members of the Business Leadership Council. Help us promote greater industry engagement greater adoption of MOC principles, greater progress on behalf of all industry stakeholders. We welcome your input about how we can increase the Business Council's effectiveness and outreach. The Business Leadership Council's job is to connect science with industry, help us strengthen that connection. So we are thrilled this afternoon to have three leaders who will demonstrate in three very different ways the business case for addressing climate change, the risks and the opportunities. Our first presenter, Hannes Dempewolf, is a senior scientist and head of global initiatives at Crop Trust, which is based in Bonn, Germany. He leads the Crop Trust's project adapting agriculture to climate change, collecting, protecting, and preparing crop wild relatives, and is responsible for developing, driving, and sustaining initiatives and projects that are of strategic importance for the Crop Trust. As such, he works with at the interface of science, policy, and resource mobilization. His scientific interest focuses on the evolution, maintenance, and conservation of agrobiodiversity, the importance of such diversity for farming communities, and the role it can play for sustainable development and food security in times of a rapidly changing climate. And just so you know, his favorite crop is the sunflower. Please welcome Hannes. much uh, for that very able introduction. Um, at the beginning of my talk, I'd like to take you to a very cold place. I'd like to take you to a very uh, far north place. Um, it is actually, it's an island archipelago called Svalbard, um, which is the very, very far north um, of Norway. It's well beyond this uh, Arctic Circle. Um, and when you get to that archipelago up there, it looks a bit like this. Uh, a lot of snow, a lot of ice, and freezing temperatures. There are more polar bears in, our, uh, in that archipelago than there are humans. Uh, there is uh, a lot of reindeer. And in the back here, what you can see is the facility that I'd like to talk to you about, about today. 
it's the Svalbard Global Seed Vault that you may have um, heard about. Um, it is a facility that um, is co-managed by my organization, the Global Crop Diversity Trust, um, together with uh, the Norwegian government and Nordgen, which is the Nordic Genetic Resource Center. Um, and this is the entrance of the vault. Why would I be taking you to such a cold, uh, not very biodiverse place um, in, in a session on, on climate change, you may ask? Well, if you enter the vault, this is what welcomes you. Boxes and boxes and boxes. And what these boxes contain, you've probably guessed it by now, is lots and lots of seeds. Um, at right now, um, we have uh, in, in the vault um, seeds from uh, more than um, 120 different countries around the world. This is a global backup facility for seed banks um, from all over the globe. So why, why does our organization, and in fact many organi uh, governments around the world, put so much effort into conserving that diversity, conserving those seeds? Well, as we've heard over the last few days, um, our food systems are facing a number of challenges. Um, we need to produce enough food that is good for you, good for farmers, and good for the planet. Climate change, the link between climate change and agriculture is, um, is dire, or it's, it's a very strong correlation between climate change and agriculture and the negative consequences of climate change and agriculture. Um, and they are, um, they manifest themselves very differently in different parts of the world. Um, I've just put a, a, a few um, case studies uh, up here. Uh, just to show you uh, in which way climate change is not, um, it, it doesn't provoke a, a uniform response across the globe, but, but instead is actually, um, is quite varied. But globally we can say that higher average temperatures, more frequent extreme weather events, changes in rainfall patterns, and, and increased pressures from plant pests and diseases are uh, predicted. Regionally, climate change will impact agricultural productivity very differently, requiring a diverse set of solutions. And this is what I'm here wanting to talk to you about here, this little word here, diversity. Um, here we are. We at the Crop Trust, and we're not, not the only ones um, who, who, who are saying this, we see a real key solution to climate change um, uh, challenges in diversity, the diversity that exists within our food systems. Um, we know that there's about, uh, that there's several million crop varieties um, around the world. Uh, we recognize about 30,000 or 35,000 edible plant species, and all of them could be important because they have each different traits. These traits often um, are, are not traits that, um, um, that, that may be required in a, in a particular growing conditions at this moment, but they may be in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. All are important because one might have the trait you need to adapt uh, to a changing climate, increase nutritional value of a certain crop, or fight diseases or produce higher yields. Um, and before I show you some examples of, of, of that, um, I'd like to draw you to, to your attention to um, our global interdependence on these, what we call genetic resources, that crop diversity. If you look at this map, this map shows you where in the world our crops originally, originally came from, where they were first domesticated. And you can see that although North America has some important ones, um, blueberries, pumpkins, some tasty ones too, um, sunflowers, and I have particular fondness for sunflowers, as, as I've mentioned. Sorry. Um, there is, um, you can see that the vast majority of our crops is not from North America. The vast majority of our crops is from what we call centers of domestication, uh, the, the most prominent one um, in, the, in the Near East and the Fertile Crescent, the origin or cradle of agriculture. Of course, another big important center of diversity is in the southern, uh, in southern South America, along the Andes with uh, Peru, um, and the Peruvian, um, Bolivian, and, and Ecuadorian Andes with potatoes and, and tomatoes and that kind of thing coming from there. The reason I'm putting this up here is because I think it's important for all of us to realize how dependent we are in our food systems on crop diversity that comes from elsewhere. 
And the other thing that's important to note is that where this diversity or where these crops first originated is where still today most of the diversity can be found. And that is important because we need that diversity to fight the climate change challenges I've been uh, mentioning earlier. So we globally are very much interdependent on these genetic resources. Um, and uh, there was a study recently that, that looked at um, how much of the calories that are consumed uh, around the world are from crops that originated from a particular country uh, or that particular region. And in uh, North America, it was uh, less than 20% of the calories consumed here are actually from crops that are found here. So just, just so you understand our enormous dependence on crop diversity from other parts of the world. Um, another thing that I w would like you to um, uh, wrap your head around is the, the process of plant breeding. Plant breeding is an enormously complex way of uh, improving food or improving crops. And it requires a model um, that is, it goes into these crosses. And um, someone actually did uh, an analysis of uh, a, 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 an important weed variety, and they found that it involved 3,170 different crosses with 51 plant genetic resources from 26 different countries. So again, this is to illustrate you why this genetic diversity in, of our crops is what, what the UN calls a global common good. It's not the, the property of any one country. It's something that humanity globally um, uh, owns and has the responsibility to care for. So just um, a few examples of how this crop diversity can help us tackle the challenges of climate change. In terms of climate change adaptation, we can use the diversity in crop breeding to deliver varieties, but we can also directly use the, um, that diversity often in, um, uh, by farmers and then later on uh, also in our, in our kitchens. There's also ways we can use crop diversity to mitigate climate change. Um, there is ways to produce new crop uh, varieties that are, require less inputs for production, processing, and consumptions that, that are better at uh, avoiding waste. They increase carbon sinks. There's a multitude of ways agricultural production can be modified using crop diversity that um, uh, benefits uh, mitigation. Here are a few examples. Um, potatoes um, are moving slowly up the Andes. Potato production system, because it's becoming warmer and warmer in, in, in places like Peru, the disease pressure at lower latitudes increases so much that farmers are literally growing the potatoes further and further and further high, higher elevations. As you can imagine, even the Andes at some point, there is no further higher they, they can go and they will run out. So it is imperative that we breed varieties of potatoes that are able to cope with these warming climates and with, um, with the disease pressure that's com that come with it. Coffee is another extremely climate sensitive crop, uh, very heat sensitive. Um, as it happens, the only coffee uh, uh, seed bank or, or, or genetic resource collection that is publicly accessible today is in, in Costa Rica and it is um, at a, such a low latitude, uh, sorry, such a low altitude that in, within 20 years we think it may be gone if we can't relocate it to a higher altitude. And that is the only crop diversity collection of coffee that exists today. Um, we have uh, worked with wild um, relatives of crops as well. Um, with, there's a lot of attention that goes into this. Um, and we found, for example, this one uh, spean species in, from Bermuda. It only exists in Bermuda. Uh, there's only a few populations left. And it has an incre incredibly deep rooting system, which is adapted to hurricanes and that kind of thing. You can easily imagine why this could be an important trait for climate change adaptation of bean production in, in the future. And my, my personal favorite, this is a, the crop I did my PhD on, <laughs> is called nuke. It is, a, it is an Ethiopian oilseed crop um, in the US, you only know it uh, as thistle seed in bird feed, unfortunately. It's incredibly delicious um, oil that it's produced in, uh, in Ethiopia. It's one of the most uh, um, prominent um, cooking oils. And it has a very, very broad adaptability, but no one uses it um, uh, 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 outside of Ethiopia. And it's uh, an incredible high value crop that, that copes well with climate change. Um, rice, there uh, have been efforts to um, develop rice varieties that are submergence tolerant uh, uh, and high salinity uh, can deal very well with high saline soils. Another example that will be important uh, for in the context of climate change. 
Unfortunately, the, true, the truth, the, the reality is that we're losing a lot of that diversity. Um, in China, we think that since the 1950s, we've lost about 90% of um, rice varieties in production. In Mexico, we think about 80% of corn varieties are gone. In India, 90% of rice varieties. In the US, we've lost more than 90% of food and vegetable varieties since the 1900s. So even though this is an incredibly important resource, this diversity in our crops, there's an extinction crisis going on out there and very few people are paying attention. Um, we depend on a shockingly fragile foundation of biological diversity in our food systems. Um, we think there's about, uh, um, sorry, there's about 30,000, I think I mentioned it earlier, edible crops. Um, yet 75% uh, of our plant-based calories depend on only 12 crops. That's a very, very narrow um, uh, dependence. We, if we go to, uh, if we look at only four crops uh, that account for more than 60% uh, of our calories, it, it, the picture becomes even more staggering. That is an incredibly uh, foolish food system if, you, if, if you're thinking about it that way. Not very resilient at all. Um, so we at the Crop Trust, um, we're an organization that works to ensure the conservation and availability of crop diversity worldwide forever. Um, we are set up as an endowment fund, so we fund seed banks um, and we fund projects to um, save and safeguard um, crop diversity. Um, and one of these uh, initiatives is this project on crop wild relatives that I mentioned that, that I happen to manage. Um, it's a quick, uh, it's a, the, the, uh, on the left here you see the wild relatives of carrots, so the original ancestors of, of the carrots you see on the right. Um, and it's a bit like thinking, uh, if you're thinking about uh, dogs and wolves, um, the, the, the domesticated variety looks quite different to the, to the wild, and that is also true for, for our crops. Uh, at the same time, these wild relatives are threatened uh, by climate change. Um, they're, we're losing them from the wild, and it's incredibly important that we take uh, um, efforts to conserve them and make them available for, for, for breeding. So food biodiversity is a key to a profitable food sector and provides an insurance policy against a multitude of threats. And in our view, investing in crop diversity means investing in options to satisfy consumers, enhance taste, increase nutritional value, and a more sustainable production. Um, we, as I mentioned, we are our funding um, agency. We are we are raising funding for an endowment fund um, to to endow the global system of seed banks. Uh, we estimate that costs about 34 million uh, US dollars per year, which would require an endowment fund of, of 850. At the moment, we're at 300 million, which is a sizable junk, but uh, not not nearly um, nearly enough to to fully fund that system. So we're working hard on on making that happen. Um, recently, we were able to uh, complete um, the uh, endowment for uh, the International Rice um, uh, Gene Bank in the Philippines, uh, which now means that 136,000 varieties of rice are conserved forever, with funding forever, to be available to anyone who wants to use it uh, for, for, for direct use or, or, or in crop improvement. Um, we've also launched a public awareness raising campaign uh, a few years ago called Food Forever, which um, uh, is trying to make the case uh, uh, why biodiversity matters so much for, for climate resilience. And it's something that we've worked with the Chefs Manifesto um, together. And um, tomorrow in the session seven, I believe, um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that matters and why we really depend uh, also on a strong cooperation with, with chefs because we feel um, that you are, or the, the food industry is, is a very good translator of the message of why we need crop diversity, why it matters to everyone, and why everyone should, should engage in, in making sure that um, that diversity is conserved. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>
For the average American, eating a meal without meat is the most dramatic step that can be taken to address global warming. Starting with a food truck in 2008 and opening his first restaurant in 2011, AIR has built a passionate base of customers, 90% of whom are not vegetarian. Clover sources an unprecedented amount of uh, its menu from regional suppliers and helps improve the health of its customers with nutritionally conscious options. Before Clover, AIR worked at McKinsey and Company advising the CEOs and CMOs of the world's top consumer and retail companies. Prior to that, he worked with Patagonia on marketing. He holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from MIT. There are now several HBS case studies about Clover Food Lab. I'm grateful that AIR joined our HBS class twice to participate with the class in a, cast, in a case discussion about Clover. Please welcome AIR Muir. Um, first, thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm really excited to be up here and, and excited to attend this conference. There are so many wonderful things happening right now, and um, I'm sure I wasn't the only one looking at all those pictures of seeds. Um, I, could, I could look at those all day long. and. Maybe someday we'll get to uh, go to Svalbard. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about, uh, you know, from, from the global, we're going to go down to the micro. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my background's pretty unusual for a restaurateur. And I was, uh, I was trained as a scientist. Um, so uh, at one point, I was wearing safety glasses and a uh, lab coat every day to work. And, and now I'm putting up a hairnet and, and, a, and an apron. Um, it, it's a pretty dramatic change. And, and what led to that was I read an article that some of you may know called Livestock's Long Shadow. And for me, that was the first time I had heard of food being connected to the environment. And I have to say, um, I have a lot of sympathy for many of our customers who don't see that connection even today. I mean, I think the awareness has been shifting dramatically. but. At that time, it was so surprising to me. I just didn't even believe it was true. And uh, I had thought of myself as an environmentalist for many years. I'd been trying to figure out what I could do to have an impact in the world on some of these things I cared about. But I was thinking about green building. I was thinking about um, you know, electric cars. I was thinking about um, green energy. And I just hadn't thought about food at all. So that was a real moment of change for me. Um, it was a quick snapshot. Uh, who here, just to show of hands, who here has eaten at Clover? Okay, cool. I, I a few more than I was expecting, uh, given that we're four hours away. So we're a restaurant company based in Boston. Uh, we have about a dozen restaurants right now. Uh, I started the company about 10 years ago, and as Mike mentioned, we, we experimented with the menu for a while before opening a restaurant. Uh, so the first restaurant opened uh, in, in 2011, at the end of 2011. Um, we are really focused on vegetables for meat lovers. So the premise is if somebody who's normally eating meat comes into Clover and has a meal with us, had a really wonderful impact. And the original idea was maybe we could get that to happen once a month. Uh, it turns out today 70% of our sales come from customers that come in more than two times a week. Um, so we actually have really heavy frequency in use. Um, a lot of our tech is built in-house, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's become a really important part of what we're doing and what we're figuring out. Our menu changes daily. So if there are restaurateurs here, um, you know, that's outside of, some very small fine dining restaurants. That's uh, something that's almost unheard of. And if you look at Clover's menu over the menu change over the course of a week, it might be 30 or 40 percent of that menu that changes. Over the course of a month, about 80 percent of the items on the menu um, have have changed. And managing all that's become a lot of what we're doing. The reason we do that is uh, part of our success in getting meat lovers to eat vegetables is making sure those vegetables taste really fantastic. And for that to work, we need to be serving what's in season. So we need to be flexible enough to serve what our farmers have coming out of their fields. And that doesn't work on four seasons a year. 
and it works on growing seedlings, which vary a lot. Uh, the last thing here, that's same store sales growth. Last year, my restaurants, um, percent, uh, you know, and, and for same store sales growth. For our industry, it's massive. I think the fast casual industry in general was down a couple percent last year. But we have, uh, I think we're benefiting from broader change that's happening in the industry, which is fantastic, and in society. Um, and we're also getting better and better at figuring out how to do what we're doing. But this is the real focus, and this drives our decisions, it drives our um, judgment of success and failure. And for Clover, nine out of 10 of our customers are not vegetarian. So if you're going to come and eat with me, it's, uh, it's not because you've decided that you've got a problem. Instead, you have to walk past a burger place, you have to walk past a chicken place, you have to walk past a bowl shop, and you have to decide that you want to eat what I'm serving because it's more delicious. Uh, so that's really um, primarily how we're driving our business. Just going back a little bit. So I was trained as a scientist. When I first had the ideas of starting Clover, I had no experience in restaurants. And uh, I, I, I was working too hard. So I took five weeks off and I had vacation time stored up. And I got a job at Panera and I got a job at Burger King. And um, this, is, this is while I was working at McKinsey and Company. Uh, and my wife was afraid some of my colleagues would come in and wonder what was going on. I said, don't worry, it's not, they, they're not gonna be visiting the Burger King in Winchester. Um, but I learned a ton. This was honestly my very first experience in a restaurant. Um, and it was wonderful. And, and I was there mostly just to gain some confidence. I, mean, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to you know, figure out, decode what Burger King was doing. I was mostly just trying to get a sense of what's it like What's the pace like in a restaurant? Who would they be working with? Um, I ended up doing something uh, totally you know, unforeseen, which is buying a food truck. Um, originally, I'd hired a chef to develop my menu. And at some point, I, la I just didn't think that was going to work. What we're trying to do is something really different. I didn't know at the time of any restaurant that was not serving meat, but had mostly meat eaters as customers. Today, I, I think we're still. Uh, as far as I know, almost completely unique in that. And I wasn't sure it was gonna work, honestly, uh, and I didn't want to invest in an entire restaurant to figure that out. I also thought that we may have to adapt and change. Our ideas, day one of what might work, pan out. And so um, I ended up using a food truck to test out our menu. Uh, so that's me in, in the very early days. Um, you can see in the background my chef, uh, that's the guy without any hair, um, and I, he was a professor at Johnson & Wales, uh, at the time and, and had been at the French Laundry um, and really helped me learn a lot about what it means to make food for a lot of people. Um, we got very busy. Uh, we used uh, the side of the truck to write the menu on and a lot of Clover's DNA was sort of developed or figured out in those early days. You'll see a lot of these things are crossed out. And that we still do is we run out of items. I, I figure we have a couple choices. We either serve frozen food or food that doesn't perish in some way, and then we can always keep it available, or we throw out a lot of food, um, or we allow the menu to run out sometimes. And so if you're a customer at Clover, you know this, that you may come in and, and the thing you think you were expecting to get may not be available. And we embrace that. Um, I think it's terrific. And we have this happen on a daily basis. Um, we try not to make, you know, we try to make sure the whole menu doesn't disappear all at once, but uh, we do let things run out on a daily basis. We also apply this sort of approach more broadly. I'm serving rhubarb right now, and uh, the rhubarb tastes amazing because I'm sourcing it from some local farms, and it's really beautiful rhubarb. I could find a source of rhubarb year-round, but it wouldn't be as compelling. And so what we'll do is when the stocks of rhubarb in Massachusetts run out, we'll stop serving rhubarb. Uh, and so it, it won't be 86 for the day, it'll be done for the season. And I think that this is um, most of, I don't know, I'd say probably most of our customers don't really understand why things leave the menu. I mean, we operate in an industry that has a lot of limited time offerings that are mostly seen as a marketing gimmick. Uh, and probably most customers assume it's that, but I do think everybody benefits from this, whether they know why or not. And, and the way they benefit is they're writing me, you know, five times a week 
in June asking when I can get the Brussels sprout sandwich back on the menu. And they don't understand that it's not on the menu because the Brussels sprouts aren't available till the autumn. But they do understand how much they love that sandwich and how much they're missing it. And, and I know that they wouldn't have fallen in love with it in the same way if I didn't have the discipline to serve it at the right time when those Brussels sprouts taste so great. So all these things are connected, although sometimes people don't understand them. I think there's a funny thing happening with our industry um, where a lot of my competitors are actively confusing customers right now about seasonality. There's a, I've, I've got sort of a record number of emails in my inbox this spring saying summer's come early or you know corn is here. And I think that it, in a, an environment where most people don't even understand growing seasons to start with, um, you know, this sort of active confusion is making that situation even worse. So we, we had some early successes, um, and then we opened restaurants. This is an example of one of those. Um, this is a, an example of the inside of one of our restaurants. Our menu is relatively small. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about some of the specific things we're doing. So um, the action we're taking against global warming is trying to swap out those individual meals that people have. And Clover's pretty small today, we're just a dozen restaurants. I hope someday we are many, many more. But already, if you look at our impact on CO2 emissions, uh, we displace um, a population about three or four times the size of the town I grew up in each year, which is pretty awesome. So the entire CO2 footprint of my town, four times over. I, I grew up in a teeny town, uh, so it's like 1,200 people. But, um, but we were, already, we're already erasing the footprint of 5,000 or so Americans, which is awesome. And hopefully we can expand that. And we're doing it um, through individual meals. So this is... Um, perhaps the most popular sandwich in Boston right now. We sell thousands and thousands of these sandwiches a day. And um, this is our take on falafel. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a vegan sandwich. I mean, it, it, when you come into Clover, there's nothing saying vegetarian or vegan. I think I'd have less business if I said those things up front to people. We're not coy about it. If people ask, we tell them. But uh, any given day, we'll have some customer say, can you go check with the kitchen to make sure there's not chicken in that soup? And we'll say, no, you, you, you're safe, you're okay. No, no, really, I'm vegan, I need you to go check for me. So um, I think that it's, uh, some of our customers understand what we're doing. A lot of them just understand that that looks really delicious. And then they eat it and it feels uh, really filling and nourishing. Um, another thing that we're doing uh, that I think is a big part of our success is we're connecting really deeply with customers. and. I don't think Clover would have um, you know, gotten to where we are today if we hadn't had this kind of success. It's part of what's exciting about being in this business. It's part of what's exciting about food. Uh, food is a great way to connect with people. And um, this is a little, this little anecdote. I was standing outside of one of our recent restaurants that was under construction, and I was taking pictures of the construction. And this guy was standing there, and he said, oh, what's going to go in here? And I said, Clover. And um, I just had my camera out because I was taking the pictures. And he, he dramatically threw his um, helmet, probably not a good idea, uh, and his book down on the ground. And he said, um, he said, no, he said, Clover. He's like, I've been here for um, years, and I wanted Clover here the whole time I was here. He's like, and now I'm leaving. He's like, I'm, I'm about to leave. And now you're telling me you're opening Clover. And then he wanted a selfie with me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that that is one of many, many stories um, of you know, that, that I think express the connection that we're able to create with people over food, which is really exciting. And this guy's not a vegetarian, he's not a vegan. And getting people that excited and that passionate about food um, it is really where our success lies. Um, I talked a little bit about seasonality, there's some examples, the Brussels sprouts. This is an a odd fruit called a pawpaw. Who here has had a pawpaw? So they're, they're a wild thing. They look like they're a tropical fruit, but they're native to North America. Um, and you can actually grow them in Massachusetts. We found a pawpaw grower, and every year for a couple of weeks we serve pawpaw, um, a lot of fun. Uh, technology's been incredibly important to what we're doing, mostly because restaurants generally don't have this kind of approach where the menu changes a lot. And so we've had to build tech that allows our menu to run out of things, does a good job communicating that to customers, makes that exciting, not scary. Um, and it's been a, a huge investment um, to date. Um, 
Transparency is incredibly important to us. This is actually my office, and it's in the middle of one of our restaurants. I'm, I've got a board meeting on Friday morning, and this is where it'll happen. And so, you know, all of our numbers and, and everything will be up there on those screens. And if you're having breakfast, you're gonna you're gonna be able to peek over Ron Shake's shoulder and see uh, what's going on at Clover. Um, we have food development meetings once a week that are open to the public as well. And uh, I think the last note I'm going to leave it on is. These are all examples of Boston area um, restaurant companies who have um, taken some practice from Clover, um, and I think that's great. I mean, the I think we're we would love to have more copycats. So hopefully, what we see in the future, five years, ten years from now, is that the number of restaurants we're operating grows from ten to twenty to thirty to forty. But um, as important, I'd love to see some of the things we're doing propagate and show up in other restaurants and, and in Boston and elsewhere. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for having me here. I'm, I've been really excited to speak to you. Thank you so much, Eric. And if you haven't been to Clover, I didn't see the show of hands, but it's, uh, it's worth the trip to Boston to give it a try. Our find, final presenter is one of my heroes in the industry. Despite the fact that my allegiances have generally been with Harvard, I will reluctantly admit that there are a few pockets of brilliance at Yale. <laughs> Just saying, and uh, Rafi is one of them. Rafi Taharian is an Associate Vice President for Yale Hospitality. He believes that campus dining operations can be a testing ground for positive and pragmatic change. He has forged collaborative partnerships within Yale University and in the food industry that have created a benchmark reputation in dining services for one of the most prominent institutions of higher learning. Since 2008, he has guided the continued development of Yale hospitality sustainability initiatives and robust culinary concepts by merging principles of a healthy, plant-based Mediterranean diet with an operational approach that promotes regionally based and sustainable food systems. Before joining Yale, Rafi was the executive director of dining at Stanford University. As an undergraduate, he studied architecture in Italy and later earned a hospitality degree right here. Rafi has received numerous awards for his vision and leadership, including, just listen to this, in 2016, Rafi was awarded both the Silver and the Gold Plate Awards by the International Food Service Manufacturers Association, IFMA. There is only one gold medal plate awarded each year. So in winning that in 2016, he joined a highly select group of industry icons, including Ron Shake, Wolfgang Puck, Rich Melman, and Danny Meyer. Rafi is a wise man. Please welcome Rafi Taharian. Michael. Thank you. I can't even give this presentation anymore. Michael, you're so kind for a Harvard guy. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, I recognize that you guys are the true maze of change warriors, that on the second day you're sitting in here at 546. And uh, I am here between you and a beautiful glass of wine and delicious food that is sitting right out there. And I promise to you that it's going to be quick and painless. And I hope your, work, your time is going to be worth it. All right. Um, can we? OK, uh, I do this. Let's watch a video together.
side. So I have three pieces of news for you. Number one, uh, our dining halls are no smoking environment. <laughs> We're not smoking in our dining halls. Number two is our students, they don't wear suits anymore. <laughs> and number three, 51, 52% of our students are female. They're not, we're no longer a male uh, 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 university. So I, I stumbled upon this particular presentation, this particular video, when, when I was doing a research two, two years ago in terms of uh, what, what's the purpose of a food service in a college and university. I gave a presentation in the National Association College University Food Service and it was important to understand what is the bottom line reason we, why we exist in universities. Because we're no longer a transactional organization. Because for years, an institutional food service was all about providing safe food in an efficient way uh, in a large number okay, for, for, for the students. And, and we were considered... Uh, institutional food service. Well, the news is we're no longer that. And so what are we actually is what uh, our provost will, wants us to be, and which is for us to create an op opportunities for our students and for faculty, uh, opportunities for collusion of the ideas. And I, and I submit to you that's exactly the same thing that has been happening over uh, decade and more at menus of change and 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 uh, world of the healthy flavors and the collaboration that we've been having all these years together, opportunity for collision of the idea across various disciplines and various industry and I and I submit to you that it's been extremely successful. I have come in here for many many years and I always walk away with tremendous amount uh, uh, amount of takeaways. That being said. In our organization, we do not have only one thing that we need to do for our students. You know, for years I've come in here and I talked about how fantastic Yale food is and how innovative we are and in, in respect to so many different things. In reality, in, in dining services across the country, in so many other schools, we have to be jack of all trades. And these are the kind of things that is not just unique to Yale Hospitality and Yale organization. These are, these are attributes that you will find in campus dining across the country in, in, in a lot of different uh, organization. But we think we take this value proposition, and then we apply, and we said, well, wait a minute, what did our provost say? We need to create collision ideas. And so then we say, well, we do a lot of transactional activities. How then we get those transactional activities, we combine it with academic research, we combine it actually with all the other things that are happening in the industry, and we create a transformational organization and no longer a transactional organization. And that's the secret of the dining organizations across the country. Movement from a transactional to transformational organization. We don't do just food, okay? We do leadership, we do literacy, we engage community, and we do sustainability and food and drinks. So that translated in Yale hospitality is going to come and is going to manifest itself under so many different initiatives, be it for students, be it for our community, be it for food waste, food R&D, you know, and th th there are so many different aspects of uh, activity that is not just food. A few pictures of what we have done in the last two years, for example, we, we, we recognize that we are not subject matter expert in many, many fields. But we have an opportunity to collaborate and cooperate with those that they are subject matter experts and bring them on board and give them an opportunity to interact with our students. About nine years ago, we focused actually on Mediterranean diet. We transitioned our menus from everything to a Mediterranean diet focus and we, we, we start bringing people that they were subject matter experts at the time. Joyce Goldstein came to our school for, for, for many months, and she started changing our menus and salads and, and all those things. Over the years, we have extended, actually, our Mediterranean uh, diet menu process, and we have had, again, subject matter experts 
we, we, we do this Mediterranean diet and we bring a food anthropologist and we ask food anthropologists to tell us actually what is in the DNA of the Mediterranean diet that not only makes it delicious, but makes it sustainable and makes it healthy for everyone. And, and we explain that to our students, why, why is it we are focused on that? We host actually a Mediterranean diet and we, 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 by the way, we measure everything. And you can see that from in two years, in terms of all the, all the metrics, uh, in, in terms of the consumption, uh, purchasing, in various categories, we have had an increase in terms of our uh, purchasing more olive oil. We're, we're actually 5.2 times American average in olive oil consumption per student. We're nowhere to be near Greek and Spain because those guys, they actually drink this stuff. But, <laughs> But, but we're, we're, we're in a good place to be, you know, and, and we continue to push these things more and more. But what's more important to me is the fact that Yale Dining and Yale, you know, as, as an institution, we are such a small uh, part of, for example, the Ivy Leagues, and then Ivy Leagues is such a small part of the uh, Northeast Corridor, and the Northeast Corridor is such a small part of the, uh, the country. So there is a tremendous amount of opportunity and potential for scaling up the kind of activities that we do in, in, in our organization. The president of the Yale says, well, I want you to actually create your objectives and your, your initiatives in your organization that they're not just unique to Yale, but it creates opportunity for collaboration nationally and internationally. So it's... Again, you know, when it comes up to the vision and goals, it's, it's very, very important that you, you see actually what the administration and institution wants to do. And for us, it's very, very, very specific. We have nine ambitions. We take down those nine ambitions and we bring them to our organization and we, it, it translates to a chart like this. That it becomes about collaboration, research and development, incubation and leadership. There are so many schools now that they are working collaboratively with the industry. You know, we, uh, today I sat on a session from Manka. You know, they did their collaboration with Harvard. They were incubating their product in Harvard Dining, which is an amazing opportunity, and such as that particular example, there, there are many, so many other schools that they are collaborating with the industry. We too have a lot of collaboration, and a few years ago, we start collaborating with Good Food Academy and the Brighter Green, and through that initiative, then we actually expand internationally. <laughs> so now we're in China. We're actually giving presentation in six different universities in six different regions in China. And we're talking about the scalability of a dining organization that food service is no longer just a transactional experience, but it's an opportunity to create change in the country. And a lot of people in China, they're actually paying attention to these things because they see their students, they can actually be champions of the change as they come out of, the, out of those programs. This is me actually in a, with a billboard in China? You know, that's the, it, it, it was just an amazing experience. And with that, we find ourselves that the ambassadors of four different countries from, from, from Mediterranean countries uh, Spain, Italy, Greek, and, and Cyprus, they were more than happy to come on our campus and talk about, you know, the commerce, the agriculture, the inhibiting factors, and how we can actually create better and greater relationship. We want olive oil. We want olive oil at a price we can buy, and we want good olive oil. And so this was, this was a great opportunity for us. We then thought wait a minute, we're going outside to other countries. What if actually we bring Chinese chefs from some of the most reputable universities and some of the most reputable hotels from China on a tour of various uh, areas in the United States?
So through this initiative, we brought a number of the Chinese chefs, and actually, president of the Chinese counterpart, uh, National Restaurant Association, coming to United States, going to four really prestigious universities, and to CIA, and to Google, experiencing what is plant-centric, plant-forward menu look like. Experiencing, actually, how a large institution and organization can reduce animal-based protein. Through this process, we, we created relationships and, and those relationships now are going to be leading us to other initiatives in terms of taking a group of the chefs from the United States now back to China and create this engaged relationship. So here's the thing. This is not just something that happens at Yale University. It is happening actually in, in, in a lot of other universities uh, in the country. Oh, by the way, these are uh, one, of, one of the uh, events that we did for these chefs. We wanted to make a point to them that uh, plant-based food and plant-centric menu can be very, very attractive, very, very high-end, and it doesn't need to be that you eat this food and you think you missed, it, you missed protein and, and you didn't have the protein. So, so it's not happening only in our organization. It's happening actually in other dining organizations across the country. People, professional management, and leadership is changing. The introduction of the chefs has been the single one most important game changer for campus dining, not just for campus dining, for the entire industry. The fact that world cuisine, now it's becoming a vernacular in everybody's food repertoire. And facilities have changed, equipment have changed. And the fact that we're competing with the casual dining and QSRs out there, uh, people that, that, that they do amazing job in, in plant-based uh, menu outside in the industry. These are not pictures of my dining organization. These are pictures of other universities, how the dining organizations across the country have changed and have transformed, transformed in something that, that is experiential dining, that is literacy-based uh, food service. So, so it, it comes to this point that, you know, I showed you a video at the, at, the, at the beginning of my presentation. There are two sentences that they were very important to me when I, when I was researching uh, campus dining. You go there for more reasons than one. It's not just a place for food of your style. Precisely. You go there for more reasons than one and it's not just a place to put food into your stomach. I'm not saying that food is not important. Food is what we do, okay? Food is the center of the attention in our organization, okay? But it's not just that. It's about leadership. It's about actually scaling up. It's about if this is a movement, we have to be able to communicate, collaborate, incubate idea, and I submit to you, campus dining is the best place to do it. Thank you very, very much. Greg and CIA, you have done once again a magnificent job, and I promise you, you guys are going to have your wine and, and delicious food. So with that, I go, I transfer it to Jackie. Well, I think as I was standing backstage thinking about this session, and actually I had a really wonderful briefing call with all of these presenters um, before the conference, thinking about the title of the session, addressing the business, the business case for addressing climate change, risk, profit, opportunity. I am not a business major. I didn't study business at all. Um, but I think of these terms when we think of business, diversify your po portfolio. I feel like that is exactly what Hannes was talking about. Build up demand through seasonality from air and from Rafi, rethinking profit from a transactional action to a transformational action. I think these are all really compelling reasons for that business case to address climate change.
Um, so thank you again to all of our presenters for this amazing session to close out this second day of the conference. We still have tons more for you tomorrow, but as Ralphie promised you, we have wine for you first. So we've got the reception outside. We're again going to be outside. We were not deterred by the rain. Um, so we're going to be in the beverage garden outside. Um, our reception this evening is featuring our bronze level sponsors. We're also having a book signing by Katie, uh, sorry, Christy Middleton. Um, she will be out there signing her uh, copies of Meatless. And again, tomorrow we'll be starting breakfast at 7.30 downstairs. Um, and programming starts back in here at 8.15. You don't want to miss it. We've got a great session on sustainable seafood, which I think continues to be a great source of confusion um, and questions for a lot of operators, as well as um, a deeper dive into biodiversity. We got a little bit of a taste of that from Hannes, and we've got um, even more content for you on that tomorrow, as well as one more round of breakout sessions. So be sure you're here bright and early, ready to go, 8.15 in this theater. Have a great evening, everyone. This is a recipe for beet tartare with a quick cured egg, a modern take on an old classic. Combine the fish sauce, Worcestershire sauce, oyster sauce, honey, hot sauce, garlic cloves, and ground mustard. Gently place the yolks in the marinade. Cover and marinate in the refrigerator for 12 to 24 hours. These beets have been roasted, peeled, and diced. Combine the beets with the mayonnaise, Tabasco sauce, cornichons, capers, and scallions, and toss gently to combine. Season to taste and hold refrigerated. Add a small amount of oil to a cast iron pan. Cut the peeled shallots in half and sear, flat side down, until they begin to caramelize. Set aside. To plate, use a round cutter to form the beet tartare. Place an egg yolk in the middle. Garnish with brulee shallots, radishes, asparagus spears, dill tops, and microgreens. Finish with dots of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. Here's our beet tartare with quick cured egg. Enjoy. Here's a great way to put produce at the center of the plate in the middle of winter. Watermelon is available year-round, and because it's a member of the gourd family, it lends itself very well to pairing with other winter vegetables. In this recipe, I'm going to use the watermelon rind and pair it with some global flavors and some spice. This is a watermelon rind masaman curry with winter vegetables. To start the curry, heat the oil in a saucepan over moderate heat, then add the garlic and the shallots and stir until it's fragrant. Add the curry paste and the chili paste or the chili flakes and stir it for about 10 seconds. Remove half a cup of the top of the creamy layer of the coconut milk and add that to the pan. Stir and cook until the paste is bubbly and the oil begins to separate. Add the remaining coconut milk, soy sauce, onions, and watermelon rind. Reduce the heat and simmer until the onions and the watermelon rind are soft. Add the remaining vegetables in the water and cook for another four to five minutes. Adjust the seasoning with fish sauce, sugar, and lime juice. Next, add the kaffir lime leaves and the basil and serve immediately over jasmine rice. This easy dish is full of warm Indian spices that will be sure to have you enjoying watermelon all year long.
This dish is a fun take on a classic gratiné, hollandaise crusted cauliflower, seasoned with cheese and mustard. Cut the cauliflower into florets, then toss the florets in a mixing bowl with oil, hot sauce, thyme, garlic, salt, and pepper. Place on a sheet pan lined with parchment paper and roast at a 425 degree oven until the florets begin to turn golden brown. About 15 to 20 minutes. Remove and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the panko, parsley, lemon zest, and cheeses, then season with the salt and pepper. Combine the Nor liquid hollandaise sauce with a grainy and Dijon mustard. Place the roasted cauliflower in a preheated cast iron pan. Top with a hollandaise sauce and sprinkle with a breadcrumb mixture. Roast for another 10 minutes or until the breadcrumbs are golden brown. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy. Find yourself throwing away watermelon rind, please don't. I'm going to show you how to candy it. And this is a recipe that you can make throughout the year since watermelon is available year round. I'm going to cut the watermelon rind by removing the green peel and all of the flesh from the inside. Then cut it into three inch by quarter inch pieces. I mix the salt with the water and I soak the rind overnight at room temperature. Drain the rind, rinse it well, and then cook it in fresh water until it's tender, which should take about five minutes. Drain it and set aside. Next, I'm gonna put the vinegar and the spices and sugar into a pot and boil it for five minutes. I'll add the rind and then boil this until the rind is clear. I remove it from the heat and let it stand at room temperature until it's cool. After I drain the rind, I'm gonna place it onto a sugar-coated pan and cover it with more sugar. Let this set out for a day at room temperature, uncovered. The next day, shake off all the excess sugar and store it in an airtight container for up to two weeks. You can use the candied watermelon rind as a garnish for cocktails and drinks. You can dip it into chocolate for a sweet, sour, and salty snack. Or you can use it as a garnish for cakes, tarts, cupcakes, and cookies. This is a light, refreshing dish featuring sustainable seafood. Alaskan black cod with a grapefruit relish and an avocado cream. In a bowl, whisk together the grapefruit juice, soy sauce, mirin, miso paste, and black pepper. Marinate the cod fillets for up to 30 minutes. For the relish, char the jalapeno over an open flame. Once cooled, seed and mince. Combine with the diced grapefruit segments, scallions, sugar, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Season to taste and refrigerate until ready to use. To make the avocado cream, combine the avocado, garlic, yogurt, Hellman's light mayonnaise, chili, and lime juice in a blender. Blend until smooth. Heat oil in a non-stick saute pan over medium heat. Pan sear the cod until opaque and beginning to caramelize. To serve, place the avocado cream on the bottom of the plate. Top with the fish and the grapefruit relish. Garnish with microgreens. Here's our finished dish. I hope you enjoy. Here's a recipe that's sure to impress your guests. I've used two types of watermelon, both red and yellow. Yellow watermelon tends to be a little bit sweeter than red watermelon. I've also used watermelon juice to create an interesting dressing. You can make this recipe a day ahead. So let's make our watermelon and avocado mosaic with Dungeness crab salad. 
Place the watermelon into a blender and blend until smooth. Let this juice sit refrigerated for one to two hours until the solids have settled to the bottom. You want to decant the clear liquid from the top, leaving the solids behind. Next, you'll want to take the decanted watermelon juice, the gelatin, the lemon juice, and the salt, and bring this to a simmer until the gelatin is melted. You may want to skim as necessary. Next, we'll make the mosaic. Place a piece of plastic wrap at the bottom of a mold. You may use some spray or some water to hold the plastic in place. I'm going to alternate pieces of the red and yellow watermelon along with the avocado inside the mold, leaving a little bit of space in between each piece. Next, I'm going to pour the gelatin over the mold, making sure to barely cover the watermelon and the avocado. Place this into the refrigerator to chill and let it set for an hour. To make a crab salad, gently squeeze the crab meat to remove any excess moisture that might remain. Place the crab meat, the lemon zest, the mayonnaise, creme fraiche, and chives into a mix toss this together until combined. To plate the salad, remove the mosaic from the refrigerator and then remove it from the mold and place it on your serving dish. If desired, heat a spoon or the edge of a knife and smooth the edges of the mosaic. To finish the dish, I'm going to place the crab salad on top of the mosaic and garnish with microgreens. I hope you'll find this watermelon and avocado mosaic with Dungeness crab salad visually appealing and fun to make. Here is a dish with spiralized sweet potatoes, clams, and a creamy Asian turmeric sauce. Using a spiralizer, spiralize the sweet potatoes into long, thick noodles. Cook the sweet potatoes in boiling water, stirring gently for about a minute or two. Drain and set aside. Heat the vegetable oil in a wok over medium-low heat. Add the sweet potato noodles. Stir frequently and cook just until tender. Remove from the wok and set aside. In the same wok, add a little oil, add the clams, turn the heat to medium, add the garlic, ginger, and chopped chili pepper. Add coconut milk and no professional liquid concentrate base. Add turmeric and fresh lime juice. Cook until the clams are open, remove, and then set aside. Reduce the broth until it's thick enough to coat a spoon and season to taste. Add the noodles back into the sauce, toss gently, and then add the clams to combine well. Place the noodles and the clams on a plate, sprinkle with furikake, cilantro, and sprouts. Garnish with lime. So here is the finished dish. Enjoy. Find yourself with an excess of watermelon, turn it into juice. People are rediscovering fermented beverages these days. This recipe for making a watermelon shrub. Heat the sugar and vinegar on the stove, stirring constantly until the sugar is dissolved. Add the watermelon and simmer to release its juices and flavors into the syrup. Cool the mixture and strain out any solids. Add water to taste. Place the mixture into a glass jar and allow it to rest in the refrigerator for four days covered. This can be blended with alcohol or other flavors of your choosing to make a delicious beverage. So here's our watermelon shrub. I've garnished it with a watermelon wedge and candied watermelon rind. 